As a journalist, I've covered crime, controversy, and lots of extreme weather. Sometimes the language we use is generic. Flash floods, rainfall, snow, and sometimes a storm gets a name. I've asked lots of questions, for work and otherwise. But one question I realized recently I hadn't thought to ask is why and how do we give hurricanes human names? So I Googled it, and then I recruited a panel of experts far more qualified than I and asked them to please explain it to me. As it turns out, the naming system is more science than art, and it's rooted in reason, a singular reason. It starts with a P. Humans love naming things. We name our cars, our guitars, our boats, and the process of naming an inanimate object or entity is usually driven by one of two forces, purpose or fun. People naming, purpose. Car naming, fun. Pet naming, both. And when we first started naming hurricanes, we named them in the same sort of haphazard way we name objects, according to our wounds. There was a hurricane back in the 1900s called uh, Antje because it wrecked a ship of that name. There was a Galveston hurricane because that was where it made landfall. One of the anecdotes is that American sailors in World War II started the practice of naming storms after their girlfriends, after their wives, after their loved ones. Sometimes it was deeply personal. And when it wasn't, we would just use latitude and longitude measurements, which sounds like a solution, but turned out to be a problem. First of all, people aren't very geographical oriented, so they may not understand exactly what that means. And the storm moves, so it's going to constantly sort of change coordinates. Uh, but then as we got into the, I think it was in the 1950s, and, and information was sort of being discussed about storms in real time. And if you had multiple storms going on, you needed to be able to clearly communicate which storm you were talking about, you know, which storm was where, where was it going, what were the impacts. And that was the impetus for starting to call the storm something in real time while they actually existed. Let's say you're at home waiting for updates about a storm called 28 degrees north, 69 degrees west. While you're asleep, it moves over to 30 degrees north, 76 degrees west. The meteorologist on your local news channel is talking about 30 North, 76 West. And now you're just confused. And if multiple storms are traversing the seas at once, as tends to happen during hurricane season, it's even harder to know which one is headed for your own coastal town. And so, in 1953, the World Meteorological Organization, the WMO, developed a standardized system for naming tropical cyclones. The NOAA forecast is 16 to 21 named storms, with 6 to 10 of them becoming hurricanes, and 3 to 6 of those becoming major hurricanes. A tropical cyclone gets a name via the WMO when its wind speed reaches 39 miles per hour, at which point it's called a tropical storm. A climb to 74 mile per hour winds means we call it a hurricane, and if winds intensify to 111 miles per hour, we use the term major hurricane. A major hurricane is a category three, four, or five. But the more specific terminology doesn't change the way we talk about storms and the associated danger. Any storm with wind speeds over 39 miles per hour gets a human name too. When it comes to naming hurricanes, it's about two Ps, purpose and public safety. As meteorologists, part of our job is to actually relay the message effectively and put it down in simple terms because we can't expect everyone to know everything. They have busy lives. We just need, we're in the business of public safety. So we need to deliver the message cleanly and effectively. And the naming process has been, a, been a, just a huge help. Claire tells me that a storm with a name is one the public takes more seriously and will more likely prepare for instead of ignore. So theoretically, the storm names could be saving lives. People, if they can sort of identify with a threat or a hazard, uh, if they can give it a name, then they take it more seriously. And so they're more likely to, you know, to, to heed the warnings. The fact that, you know, you, it's got a hashtag these days on social media, you know, you can easily research it. Um, and so, you know, we hope by having names um, that, you know, people, people will take them seriously. From the 1950s through the 1970s, storms were exclusively assigned traditionally female names. The theory is this was the case because the primarily male meteorologists would name storms after the women in their lives. By the late 1970s, the WMO had added traditionally male names to the list. 
today, there are six lists of 21 names each. A committee of representatives from 29 countries, including the U.S., discusses names each year as a small part of a big meeting. Most of the meeting is about the impact of the previous season's storms. When a storm is particularly severe and causes an extraordinary amount of damage and death, committee members will nominate its name for retirement, a measure put into place out of sensitivity for the communities and individuals affected by the storm. That's why new names show up on the recycled lists. And to us, the whole list looks new. It may seem like storms with names in the H-I-J-K stretch of the alphabet are more severe than A-B-C-D, for example. And that's true. That's because we designate names alphabetically. And we're usually in the worst part of hurricane season by the time we get to the letter H. It's also true that end season names like Virginie and Walter have likely been around a while because stormy seas are often calming by the time we get to them. Names in all areas of the alphabet are retired. Katrina, Sandy, Florence. It's just more common that we'll retire an I name, like Iris, than a W name. Wilma was retired in 2005 and held the title of farthest retiree into the alphabet for the next 15 years. As new names earn their spots, the lists become more diverse. Some names old fashioned, others newer, and additions from around the world. It's not just for people in the US. You know, these, these hurricanes, these storms affect other linguistic and cultural groups in the, in the Caribbean. And so we have to make sure that these names are understandable to, to everybody, be they Hispanic or, or, or Francophone, you know, English speaking. Um, you know, they have to be straightforward. People have to be able to understand them. It matters that we name storms, but whether it matters what we name them is up for debate. A 2014 study alleged that feminine named hurricanes caused more deaths than masculine named hurricanes. The theory was simple. Society's inherent sexism skews our perception, so we feel less threatened by a feminine named storm and are less likely to prepare for it. But despite the clickbaity nature of such findings, or in accordance with it, the study was controversial. Following its publication, meteorologists, statisticians, and researchers published in their rebuttals. The Washington Post's Jason Same Now published a 2017 revision to his 2014 piece about the study, detailing all of this and noting that he was updating the headline on his original story. Feminine named hurricanes kill more than male hurricanes because people don't respect them, study finds, became female named hurricanes probably do not kill more people than male hurricanes. Anyway, we name storms for ease of communication, not for fun or entertainment but I'll leave you with one story about the ways we humans take something scary and serious and find the levity in it. In 2017, Hurricane Harvey made landfall in Texas, and Hurricane Irma made seven landfalls, four among the Northern Caribbean islands as a Category 5, and others in parts of Florida as a Category 4 and 3. Both were major hurricanes, and both names were retired. There was a newspaper which um, did a story which, you know, under the circumstances, it was quite a touching story. That newspaper was the New York Times. Jonah introduces us to two people whose names might sound familiar. Meet Harvey and Irma, a Florida couple celebrating their 75th wedding anniversary in 2017, the same year their namesake hurricanes hit. Irma told the Times that year, I don't know how they've done that, to have a Harvey and Irma. I don't know how that worked out. Well, we do.